Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Davis uh, from Platform Consulting Group. I'm a platform architect. My name is Frank Caruba. I'm VP of Software Development for Medsys International. And we're going to uh, talk to you today in this presentation around uh, the journey that we took in an eight-week project to move from really zero code, no code, on the mobile side and also on the microservices, all the way through to deploying out to PCF and having a uh, working uh, mobile app. So uh, last year we were uh, given a problem from the World Health Organization of uh, the vaccine, international vaccine record. Um, does anyone have a yellow book or have, has, has anyone heard of a yellow book? Let me, I'm going to go ahead and, bring, and show, bring a couple of them out to people, okay? So, so what this does is this allows, you to, this allows you to travel from country to country. Um, what happens is, is that you need to have certain vaccinations to go to different countries. And to have a valid record, you need to go to a doctor, get a vaccination. They have to fill this book out, and then you have you're able to travel to another country, to Africa, say. Well, what's going on is you can easily get these books by just going to the World Health Organization website, downloading them, or purchasing them. You fill them out, and now you have a valid record because it's not digitally. And there's tremendous amounts of fraud happening when, they go, when someone goes to a border uh, in Africa, per se. They may be actually refused entry, not because they don't have a valid passport, but because there's a presumption of fraud from the yellow book, maybe it doesn't look right, or you know, someone says, well, this, this yellow fever vaccine is an older yellow va vaccine. It could be uh, any sort of combination of factors because it's, it's a piece of paper that's not really able to be validated. So what our solution is, is we create a new booklet, and in the back of the booklet, we actually embed an NFC chip. This is imprinted with the actual vaccine record. Also, it has the citizens biometric artifacts on it. So then when a citizen goes to a border and tries to cross, they scan the citizen's biometrics, iris, fingerprint, or facial, using, using a mobile device. And then we scan this chip, and this chip will do a one-to-one -one biometric link that validates that the actual booklet belongs to the citizen. So we had a few challenges uh, in putting this together. Uh, if you really think about how you're going to go about, you know, doing this, you know, to really, uh, we we started to, you know, really, come, you know, from an approach standpoint, we were really thinking of, well, how are we going to secure this? How are we going to imprint this chip? And we started out really thinking about the security implementation. We decided that we really needed to have a heavy security presence. That was. As far as requirements, this is probably about like 50% of our requirements, 50 to 60 in that eight weeks. So it was a, a pretty uh, heavy, you know, focus on security. And one of the other problems that we had was finding a vendor for an NFC chip to work with us to have the proper file structure. Um, we really are trying to target the NFC chip in the back of a passport because eventually what we want to do is utilize uh, an allocation of memory that's reserved for future use to write our vaccination record into it. That way, we no longer need our booklet. It could actually just be embedded into the back of the passport. So we worked with the manufacturer, and we have that uh, file structure to allow us to future-proof our application. The other, uh, you know, if you think about how we're going to construct the application, you're talking about eight weeks, right? How are you going to get started and get finished in eight weeks? You really have to have a very solid view of what your data is. And you, we really tried our best to really push the development in, in such a fashion so that it was using you know, standard domain modeling techniques. So you know, we really we, we combined that in with microservices. And, and the challenge really was, was doing that in a short you're trying to do that in an extremely short period of time. And the lessons learned you'll see through the presentation really is, is that that's, that's quite difficult to do in a, in a short you know, spurt of, of development. Now, uh, the other piece of that was, was 
how do you allocate resources to actually do the work? And we combine really, you'll, you know, we think about the challenge of allocating, you know, six individuals across a large set of microservices. Um, that was a big challenge for us. And the other issue that we had was our, our initial setup of our Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We had to make sure that we configured it the correct uh, way. Uh, we weren't sure exactly what configuration or registration services that we would need for our microservices, and also what uh, you know other services, as in RabbitMQ or uh, a vault uh, for PCF secrets. Also, uh, like the MySQL service broker, we, not, we had to make sure that those things were set up correctly for our size of the project. What do we use? The Kafka service broker? Do we use RabbitMQ? Do we use the configuration, bro you know, configuration service within, you know, within Cl within Cloud Foundry? The key really is is that you got eight, You only have eight weeks. You have a very short period of time, and you want to make good decisions in order to make it to that MVP, that minimally viable product. So what we did was we drank the Kool-Aid. Um, we were very agile at the time, uh, but before we actually wrote code, we already had some plan in place. Uh, we already had a mobile design workflow. We had an uh, admin portal, wireframe, um, and we really stuck to uh, an open collaboration with our team. Uh, if it wasn't for having that open collaboration and everyone having a say for a solution, I don't think that we would have been able to make this eight week uh, period? So key is agile is as agile does. You really have to maintain, to, to, to really execute on this plan that we had, we knew that we needed to implement in an agile way. We needed to have the team really work at one week sprints. We needed to have, you know, all of the ceremonies that you would normally do, we try to accomplish them as much as possible. But the key piece of it was really to have the development team do test-driven development and extreme programming as much as possible. We didn't have time to have this long QA process. I mean, if, if we had, uh, you know, think about it, if we have a giant, you know, this long QA cycle, it probably would have been, for the amount of work that we did, probably around three to four weeks. We never would have made the development. So what we did is really embedded the team, the development team, as being the QA team. And then we also had quite a bit of uh, continuous integration with moving out to PCF as, most, as much as we could, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, that is. Um, and one, I guess the essential piece is we failed. We failed multiple times during that, that eight weeks. We had stuff that broke. But we, didn't, we weren't afraid of failure. And we weren't afraid to, to actually make mistakes and try different things, even in an eight week uh, you know, quick development cycle. We failed fast, often, and better each time. That was the key for, to our success. Um, and really, for the eight period, the eight week period, we really had to have really short sprints. Uh, so one week sprints were our, our goal. Um, we did have the first week, I believe it was a two week sprint, and we realized that that was too long for the amount of time that we had. So we did one week sprints, and we were able to do that very effectively. And, and Cloud Foundry really played a big part in this because it enabled us to move very quickly to an integration. So. Not sure if anyone is familiar with Git Push uh, Force. Did anyone catch that, by the way? Do we want to go back and see it again? <laughs> we go. Oh, oh, sorry. Hold on. Oh, there. There you go. So. It's on one of my favorite memes. So you know, every project has source control. Uh, we use GitHub, uh, but we didn't do branches. Uh, the way that our team was designed and the user stories were designed, we, we were able to have our developers work on a single repository at a time, allowing them to collaborate. And, every, and every, every repository represented a microservice. Right. So we, we were able to have these work, you know, individual work streams all working at the, same, at the same time and extremely agile. And within this, about the sixth week, we got Concourse up and running uh, to do our unit tests. And we realized the biggest lesson that we learned is to be able to be really successful, we had to push to the cloud and push to the cloud often. 
because one person is working on one repository, well, if they push to the cloud, it might not work with what's already there because everyone's working on a separate repository. Especially if they change the interface on. <laughs> that always seems to happen. But if we, you know, what we did is we had, what was it, three different spaces? Yes. And, we, and what we did is we, we separated them out and had releases out to the mobile application. Yep. We had, we had uh, dev, dev plus one, and release. So the dev plus one for us is really just a kind of like everyone needs to push to that as much as possible in their development cycle and test everything out in that environment. Now, uh, the issue was really, though, is that that's, that's all dependent if you have a PCF environment up you know, in an eight-week project and you're starting from scratch. Do you always have PCF up or, or CF up immediately? It isn't always the case. So. <laughs> we had to use some Docker magic to actually get container magic to actually start from scratch and make it work. Uh, now, uh, I know this is, you know, when we talk about Docker, it's, uh, it's not really, in my opinion, the preferred technology, but this is where we started. And this is, we actually were using Docker for our uh, concourse. So we used it as a starting point for doing our testing. When you think about uh, what we went to, we keep talking about, is that by the fourth week, we had everything in place, the fourth to fifth week, for our, our PCF environment. So we immediately were able to start testing with that. Prior to that, you really need to have something to test with. You have to do integration testing. You have to run your unit tests. You have to have everyone uh, running. And, one of the biggest dependencies that we had was that we needed to have a security container up and running during, while we were running our own tests. So that also created a scenario where we really needed to have something, and in this case, we used Docker. Now, this is, it's one of those things where it was just the most available tool for us to use, uh, but I think, any, you, I, I think the new dev, uh, Pete, the dev CF, that's something we're moving to as, as soon as possible, now that that's been released, as soon as they put it onto Linux. Another thing about Docker that people don't realize is if you're doing Android development on a Windows machine, Docker and Android Studio emulator do not play well because of the Hyper-V uh, So it, it, that was a, actually a delay for us. Yes. We hit, a, we hit a problem with that. So it's a big lesson learned is, Invest, have some, <laughs> do some research beforehand, because that can be a real problem. Uh, you know, but in essence, we were able to overcome that, and, and what we did is we actually separated the teams. We said, Indiv these individuals are only gonna do basically mobile development, and to finish up the mobile app, and then the rest of the guys just, you know, you don't, you know, you're just gonna work on the microservices. So we created, uh, you know, in an eight-week project, that's not a big deal, but that's not a strategy you wanna use long-term. So uh, in order to implement that, I, mean, I keep talking about security. I keep talking about what we used. We used uh, UAA. Is anyone familiar with taking UAA out of a PCF and using it? I've never, actually, you're the first person that I've ever seen actually raise their hand. So it's actually unusual. But we found that we needed to have a quick um, implementation of OAuth 2. And it actually is, it's open source. It, UAA is a nice piece of software. Um, what we, and it, it works immediately when you bring it down. And it works perfectly in PCF. So there isn't really like any sort of integration that you have to do, it just works. Problem is, that was what we thought. <laughs> so our lessons learned on that was, you know, what, how long did it take for us to get that going? Uh, probably about four or five weeks. Yeah, four or five weeks for us to really use it. Um, part, you know. Yes, the struggle it, is real. The struggle is real, but one of the things that we learned, I mean, we'd love to share with you guys, is that uh, you must have a spring security person. If you're doing, you know, spring boot, which is what we're using, have a spring security guy on hand because you're going to need them. If you're going to do any sort of OAuth 2 implementation, what, what we learned was is that the, it, it does work, by the way, it works really nicely. It's just there's a lot of repeated code, a lot, especially when you have multiple microservice repositories, you're going to have a lot of extra code, a lot, you know. So what we did um, we, in our present uh, MVP is we've actually pulled all that code out and made uh, annotations for it. 
So that's something that I would recommend anyone do. Uh, if you're going to use even, it, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't really matter whether you're going to use, oh, you know, uh, UA if you use UA or, or any other OAuth 2 implementation. It, it, the, yeah. So some of our next steps that uh, we're going to be taking for our next MVP, uh, one of the biggest things is that we're going to be upgrading our PCF version to 2.2. Um, that's going to allow us to use the new Cred Hub uh, security uh, to keep our secrets. And also, we want to start using uh, the new Kubernetes uh, functionality uh, in that platform. Yeah, we, we have quite a few, you know, I don't know, three or four, I guess, you, to put a number on it, services that we use outside of PCF. We would like to uh, deploy all of that onto Kubernetes and in the future. So that's, that's what we're really looking at. Uh, we also are really looking at implementing an event queue. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, is that we, the system that we have right now is what I would call more of a collector of data. It collects information. It's, it's, not, an, it's not the uh, system of record. So when we collect the data, what's going to happen is, is that it's going to push, it's supposed to be pushing that data to a central, uh, central data repository, maybe a data lake, perhaps, that would then get analyzed and squished back down, meaning that if you have someone who uh, perhaps uses the same name, or which happens a lot in countries where there's no real identification of individuals, that we're going to try to do as much normalization as possible, but we're not going to try to do that on our operational database. We're actually using a separate tool that's going to use artificial intelligence to refactor the data and then push it back up to us. In order to implement that, what we're going to have is an event queue that runs every single time we have a create, update, or delete on any of our data, it will send out a, an event that will go onto a queue that will get processed. And then we're also going to implement advanced biometrics. Uh, what I mean by advanced biometrics is currently we only do a one-to-one -one match. What we want to do is implement a one-to-n or one-to-many match. So that will allow a, a civilian to enter one of our clinics, have them get scanned in, and if they don't have their document with them, then they can be, our database will find them from their biometric because, artifacts. Because normally you'd have that, that document. If, if they're not found in, the, in our database, then we can create a new record and, and issue them a new booklet. Um, or we can, if they're found, then we can print out a new book for them um, if they lost their book, say, for so example. The, net, the other, one of the other major pieces we're looking at developing is an advanced, what I call advanced workflow. And this is the ability to, at, um, at runtime, be able to, let's say that you have an individual that's uh, using that's that's going to basically do a registration for someone. They may go through and do all of the processes, and they, or they may not. They may there may be an individual who just takes the person's name and scans their passport, and then the second person actually does the iris scan. But today that process is pretty much a linear process, so you wouldn't have the ability to have different individuals. They'd have to pass the the, the actual device or phone from one person to another. Uh, what we would like to do is create a almost like a, a, a people workflow, but have that work asynchronously with, with the device. Uh, that's all going to be done using microservices and the, you know, and the event queue that we're putting in place. And then we also want to deploy to different cloud providers. Currently, we're only deploying to GCP, um, but in the future, we want to be able to not only uh, deploy to different uh, cloud providers, but multiple at the same time, to, to be able to have our services running on you know, three different cloud, cloud providers. Um, yeah, depending on cost and, and whatever you know, the actual government entity wants us to work on. Remember, we could have an on-premise scenario. We could have, it could be GCP, it could be Amazon, or any combination of, the, of all of those. So we're working to you know, kind of work out you know, a common denominator between all of them. I do have a demo on this phone. It does not do the biometric scans because I don't have the biometric devices inside this device. We have a specialized device for that, right? Um, yes, but if you'd like to see what we have done outside, I'm more than happy to show you. 
Um, any questions? Any questions? Yes. Yes. Because most uh, Android, so we only have an Android app uh, because iPhone won't allow you to. And also, it's a modified device that has a third party FIPS certified uh, iris scanner and fingerprint reader. Because, so we have access to that data. Say that again. Well, we want to be able to deploy, you know, applications that really aren't a good fit for a PCF implementation. So uh, maybe it's a pa it's a piece of package software, or it's something that wouldn't be easily put into. You know, maybe it works with uh, ports. Something and uh, what comes to mind, but isn't really a good example. Something like Kafka, because there is a there is a tile for Kafka right now. But let's say there wasn't. We would really like to you know, to have that deployed onto, onto Kubernetes. And we're really looking at some different databases. We have, a, you know, a group working with us from a data perspective, and that's going to perhaps use a different port than 80 or 443, and it seems like just a better fit to work on Kubernetes. Does anybody have any other? Oh. At week zero, we had uh, the workflows already in place. We had a little bit of planning prior to that. At, at week zero, uh, what we really did was we did a, a, a scoping of what functionalities we can do in eight weeks. Um, so we took those plans and we broke them out and, and made sure that we can make the time frame. We used the uh, inception process that Pivotal has for Pivotal Labs. And what that does is it really kind of, it's, it's really a prioritization scheme where you come to, to basically put on to, you know, what into different quadrants, what makes sense to do, what's most important to do right now, what isn't that hard, what, you know, what is complex, what you can fit. And you, what you try to do is actually try to see what can you actually accomplish in an MVP of X number of, of sprints. Well, that's something we're moving to to make that decision. Yes. For right now, we, we, we are not using anything specific. Any, any other questions? Questions? I'm not sure I understand what your question is as far as role. We're not 100% sure yet. We haven't really we haven't looked at that, that yet. You know, yet. We're, what we do, and I think it's a, we look at these, at these questions like, that's one of the questions we're actually looking at right now. What, what decision can we make? Now, we couldn't even really make that decision as far as having it integrated, how well, you know, having it be under one environment. We couldn't even really talk about that until now because it wasn't part of, of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So now that it is, we really want to start looking at what would be the right approach. Um, and what can we fit it into our next eight week cycle? Any other questions? Mostly, uh, well, we had an issue with, this is just something that came up over the past few weeks. We've uh, our, we have a small, what's the version of PCF we're using, like a, a smaller? Uh, yeah, PCF Lite. We're using PCF Lite, which doesn't allow us to put in the Kafka tile. So we are actually hosting that separately right now in, in, a, in, a, basic, in a virtual machine that would like to move that to, to, you know, underneath with Kubernetes. And we're trying to figure out what the right solution is. Uh, but those are the types of things where there isn't a tile. It doesn't make sense to have it within. Within, we also are looking at perhaps doing things like, uh, you know, my, maybe a MySQL cluster 
that doesn't exactly look exactly like what you know what PCF creates. Remember that, that PCF. When it has the tile, it's really great. It creates a nice cluster, but it may not have all the features that we would want. Doesn't particularly, it doesn't always have exactly what you need. And so you sometimes you have to use, you know, it's a good it's a good choice to use it that way. Another item is that we have another group creating some applications around data right. that that isn't going to be in PCF. So that's the other choice. That's the other uh, piece that we're really looking at. That's why we're considering Kubernetes. Does that help? That's a really good question. It goes to that's in that get good thing, you know. Right. I actually am a big fan of feature branching, and when I talk to you know, so, when I, let me add, let me let me have Frank answer that a little bit better. So, I have a microphone. Yeah. Uh, so, the reason why uh, we used master and not feature branch is because each developer was in charge. Due to their stories, we made sure that the sprint. That developer was only working on one re repository. So when they did a uh, git push, there was no, or git pull, there was no conflicts. Um, and then once the push happened, they deployed to the cloud, and then they were able to see if their branch was actually working. So if you that's, think that's the whole fail fast, fail often. Say yeah, in, in this case, yes. the way that we did our user stories was really to, to tailor it to that methodology for such a short. Now, this isn't something you can maintain over a long no. period of time. In fact, now we're looking at different ways that we can, you know, maybe we do pull requests now yeah. because we're we're getting to a point where we have people actually working in, working in each other's repositories. Right. Uh, but you know, when you're talking about an eight week, we're talking very specifically around an eight week project. This worked for right. the first eight weeks. It's not going to be able to but sustain itself. I do think, though, I mean, my, my personal kind of approach to this is to create, you need to craft your user stories in such a way that your team, it, it, it follows into a pattern of work streams. And that works very well. The hard part is, is, is getting the product manager, getting everybody else on the same, you know, it doesn't always work that way. They may say, well, that, but in reality, if you want to finish something in eight weeks with going from zero to mobile, you almost have to go in a situation where you have everyone stepping in, in, in the same, like almost like stepping in line, All, everyone stepping in the same direction at the same exact time in order to make it. Uh, does that answer your question? Obviously, you have to have lots and lots and lots of test cases. If you're doing test-driven development, you have a ton of you know test cases. Unit test cases are extremely important. I mean, they are the foundation for everything that you're building. So I would answer that the assumption is, is that you have tons of, of unit test cases. But if you have an individual who's going to who's going to develop right on top of someone else's code, which does happen a lot. It doesn't make for a for work streams that will actually work. That will that will actually can march together in an eight week project. Does that you know? Does that sort of make sense? So you have to focus on as a, as leaders. You know, you have to focus on creating a scenario where your team could be successful, and that's what you have to do. So we're really that's what that's our lesson that we learned was that once you do that, once you have everyone working in, in a correct way, and it's agile and test-driven development, a lot of all of the 
kind of like the stuff that goes around, the conflict that goes around projects kind of falls away and people just get to work. I'm um, not sure what you mean by that. You mean the, which interface? Is the user interface? Like the, or the user interface or the? To, to a certain extent, yes. We did, the, the hard part really was is that in this project, we developed a lot of the microservice like models early and then that defined the, how the mobile, the mobile app was gonna work. So. We did, in a way, we did that, but that just seemed like the right thing to do. So. Yeah, I think we're running out of time. Do you want to show a demo? Oh, it's 11.55? Okay, Any, you know, if anyone wants to see the app, we'll have it out there for anyone who wants to look at it. Thank you.